welcome and good afternoon to all. Um, we're excited to have almost 350 people on this call today for a critical and timely conversation with Matthew Desmond, Ms. Deborah Arnold, and Melanie Griffith. We're talking today about evictions and the national housing crisis. I am Dawn Phillips, Executive Director of the Right to the City Alliance, and I will be moderating today's discussion. I want to encourage anyone who's not speaking right now to please mute your phones and mute your computers. Thank you. So Right to the City is a national formation of community organizations across the country who are engaging working class and communities of color in resisting and transforming historically disinvested and disenfranchised communities into thriving and sustainable ones. Right to the City is proud to have sponsored the birth and continued the development of Homes for All, a national land and housing justice campaign working on local to national change in the areas of renters' rights, development without displacement, and alternative land and housing models. We currently have 52 partner organizations in 30 cities across the country who are committed to the values and vision of Homes for All. And some of those values include the assertion that housing is a human right and that housing should ideally be owned by the community in which it is located. Some elements of our vision include shifting the ways in which we as a country think about land and housing as well as securing millions of affordable, sustainable homes for working class and communities of color nationally. This year, Homes for All initiated the Renter Nation Training Series, a monthly webinar where we are discussing different policy and campaign tools with the goal of sharing lessons, expertise, strengthening local to national work, and inspiring action to grow our movement. To date, we have had three sessions on rent control, just cause eviction, and community land trust, and we've engaged a total of 550 participants in the series. On today's call alone, we are being joined by 360 people. Today's call is focused on the issue of evictions, and we are very excited to have three powerful experts. We will hear first from Matthew Desmond, followed by Deborah Arnold, and finally, Mel Melanie Griffith. I'll do a more detailed introduction of each of our speakers shortly. Their presentations will be followed by a question and answer session and a short closing. Even though all participants on the call will be muted, we strongly encourage your participation. Please use the chat box to make comments, ask questions, and tell us your stories and experiences on the topic. We have a team of folks who will be monitoring, responding to, and sharing your comments. We also encourage everyone who can to tweet about the call. On the screen, you see the hashtags that we are using, as well as the Homes for All Twitter handle. Please help me in welcoming Matt, Deborah, and Melanie to our national dialogue on the eviction epidemic and solutions to mass displacement. This is where everybody <laughs> types into the chat box. That's right. Woo clap, 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 virtual clapping. Lots of clapping. All right. So um, as you can see, uh, these are our presenters today and we're, uh, we're excited. You, you already see Ms. Deborah. Ms. Deborah, could you give us a wave? There you go, excellent. Um, so I'm Dawn Phillips. That's Miss Deborah. Um, Matt, are you? Um, are we going to be able to see you right now, Matt, or should we just begin the conversation? Matthew, um, if you are speaking, you are muted. Matthew, 
Matthew? Are you there? Matthew? Testing? Could I get a little help from uh, Tony, Mark, or Malcolm to see if we can find Entry Matthew? and exit chimes are on. Entry and exit chimes are off. Matthew, are you still with us? All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pre All attendees are muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All attendees Matthew, are muted and may unmute themselves okay. by pressing star six. All right. So, right Matthew, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Matthew, you can hear me, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. All right. So, um, everyone, I'd like you to join me in introducing Matthew, in welcoming Matthew Desmond. Uh, Matthew is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of Social Science at Harvard University and co-director of the Justice and Poverty Project. Can anyone who is not speaking please mute your phones except for Desmond? I'm sorry, Matthew. So, okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Matthew is a prolific author of several award-winning books, including On the Fire Line and Evicted. Poverty and Profit in the American City, which we will be discussing today. His work has been supported by the Ford, Russell Sage, and National Science Foundation, and his writings have appeared in the New York Times and Chicago Tribune. On 2015, um, Matthew was also awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant. His book, Evicted, tells the story of a growing eviction epidemic nationally from the perspective of eight families from Milwaukee and the landlords that they rent from. The book highlights the fact that most low income renters spend more than half of their income on housing and that for single moms in particular, evictions and the threat of evictions are becoming a part of daily life. This book provides a deep and intimate view of one of the most urgent issues facing America today as more and more families grapple with the reality of housing insecurity caused by growing inequality. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today and congratulations on the success of the book. I can tell you, you that housing organizers all across the country are deeply excited um, for the way in which you and, the, and your book have lifted up the critical issue and the work that we do every day. So thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Great. I wanted to start first by asking you to um, tell us a little bit about how it, it is that you came to write about the issue of eviction. Uh, I, so America's weird uh, because it's the richest democracy with the worst poverty. And that's uh, something that's always troubled me and something I've always found wholly unnecessary. And I wanted to understand the role that housing plays in that story. You know, we had, a lot of uh, books on the role of jobs, welfare reform, mass incarceration, uh, and how those uh, were really driving inequality in America. Those are really important, but we didn't know a lot about uh, housing and uh, the private rental market in particular. And so I thought eviction was a really good way of, of getting into that. Great. As you know, Homes for All came about because all the organizations involved feel deeply that we are currently facing a national housing crisis. Can you talk more about um, how evictions are contributing to that crisis? Yeah, so um, as you guys well know, we've seen these three things happen over the last uh, 10 years. Incomes, especially for families of moderate means, have basically been flatlined or stagnant. But housing costs from rent and utilities uh, have risen by enormous proportions. So between now and 1995, for example, uh, median rent in the country has increased by about 70%. Uh, 
And, uh, and then you've had kind of a reluctance of uh, the federal government to bridge the gap, you know, and the vast majority of folks in America that qualify for any kind of housing assistance don't receive it. And under those conditions, evictions um, have become common because we've reached a point today where the majority of families who are renters that live below the poverty line, the majority of those families spend at least half of their income on rent. And 70%, excuse me, one in four of those families spend over 70% just on rent and utilities. And so, you know, if you're someone that's paying 60, 70, 80% of your income on housing, you don't need a major setback or huge, you know, dislocation to invite an eviction. And so we've moved from a country where eviction used to be rare and draw crowds to a country where eviction has become, frankly, commonplace in some of our poorest neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I see me and Melanie nodding our heads over time. Yes, that deeply resonates, I think, with the work that, that we, we, we've done. Um, your book is actually um, does a really powerful job in describing the relationship between evictions, poverty, and race, which you're starting to talk a little bit about. Can you say more about how you see those connections and and what's happening in the, the United States today with, you know, this, the, the issues, the, the, the triple issues of evictions, poverty, and race. Yeah. Um, as you guys know, the face of our eviction epidemic is moms with kids. You know, and if you go into basically any urban housing court in the country, you just see a ton of kids running around. Until recently, the housing court in the South Bronx had a daycare inside of it because there were so many kids coming through its doors. And low-income African-American women and Latino women, and mothers in particular, are exposed to eviction in incredibly high rates. So among Milwaukee renters, Evicted is a book that's set in Milwaukee. Among Milwaukee renters, one in five black women report being evicted sometime in their life, compared to one in 15 white women. And so the way I think about this is, you know, eviction is something like uh, the feminine equivalent of incarceration. You know, many of our uh, young, poor African-American men are being locked up, and many poor African-American women are being locked out. Um, and so there, there, is a, there is a story there about legacies of racial disadvantage, ongoing mechanisms of racial discrimination, poverty and eviction, and gender and mothering. Um, uh, it's important to point out, I think, that evictions aren't just uh, in inner cities. They're in immigrant communities. They're in low-income white communities. Uh, they're found uh, on the coasts, and they're found in the middle of the country. Uh, today, according to the national estimates, one in five of all renters in America uh, report spending at least half of their income on housing. So it's a widespread problem. Um, yeah, that that that's... Uh... I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to keep saying the same thing over. That's very resonant with the work that we, that we do. Um, can you, you know, so you, you talked already about this idea, and, you know, I, I think I'm paraphrasing this quote that has been attributed to you in the book, what you just talked about, which is the ways in which eviction um, for black women is analogous with mass incar the impact of mass incarceration on black men in the United States. Um, you know, could you say, you know, you've said a lot about it. Can you, can you kind of draw it out? I think what I'm interested in having you share with, with our listeners is, can you say a little bit more perhaps about the historical roots of how you think um, this came to be um, in terms of like the, the kind of longer trajectory and the historical development of housing um, and, and race in this country? How, how did that um, come to be? What, 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 uh, this current situation right now? There's so much to say about that question. It's a really deep question. Um, but one thing that we might just say is that um, today uh, about 70% of white folks are homeowners, uh, but only 40% of black folks are. And uh, uh, around, uh, there's around 40% of Latino folks are. And so you have a a pretty significant discrepancy in terms of who owns their homes today, which tracks along racial divides. So why is that? And there's a historical answer, you know, and 
if you just look at the African American case, uh, one way to tell the story uh, of the of the last couple hundred years um, of racial injustice against African Americans is a story about a systematic disposition of black folks from the land, which goes back to slavery, sharecropping, from the northern migration into inner city ghettos, and the kind of lack of access to home ownership, to redlining, and to private mortgages. Uh, to today, where the majority of African American families are renters, and um, and so I think that in the in the current affordable housing crisis, um, one way to understand who's disproportionately affected by rising rents is to ask uh, who's a renter and who's a homeowner, and what does our history tell us about why that's the case. Thank you. Um, can you say a little bit about how you actually you were actually able to study kind of statistically based on data? Can you share a little bit about the methodology you used to be able to study this whole um, phenomenon of evictions? Um, how were you able to kind of uh, surface the impact of the problem? How how if other people are interested in, 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 in doing similar types of work, how, how can they and should they go about doing that? Um, so I'll, t I'll tell you what I did, and, and then I, I have a few ideas about that last question. So I started this work the old-fashioned way. I moved it to a, a trailer park on the far south side of the city of Milwaukee, and I lived there for about five months. And then I moved into a room in a rooming house in the inner city and lived there for about 10 months. And from those two neighborhoods followed families that were getting evicted and their landlords doing the evicting. Um, uh, but I was confronted with all these questions along the way about that, that I couldn't get at by just, you know, that kind of investigative reporting work. Like how often does eviction happen? Who does it happen to? What are the long-term consequences of it? And so I thought I needed to collect some more statistical data on that. And so I, I did a few things. I designed a big survey and ended up surveying 1,100 renters uh, in the city of Milwaukee and asked them 250 questions about all kinds of things, you know, um, their kids, their moves, their evictions. Um, and I also interviewed 250 people right after their eviction court hearing. So actually embedded researchers in eviction court and uh, and give them a very short survey because we wanted to know, you know, why do you get evicted but you don't, um, even though, you know, you like, oh, your landlord the exact same amount. And then I analyzed eviction records. And this is something that a lot of us can do, I think. You know, um, you can pull um, eviction records from, um, from court data that's usually electronically stored. And usually folks use those data to search by name or case. If, if you can do that, that means there's a huge data set behind that interface. And learning how to scrape that data or collect that data is one way to get really good information about the frequency of eviction in your city and where those evictions take place. Um, and I've done that in Milwaukee, and now we're trying to collect data from a lot of other cities around the country. Thank you for letting me know I was on mute, Matt. Um, so I was starting to say in the book, you refer to evictions as violence against the people and communities that it affects. Can you say a little more about this idea of like how evictions is actually a form of like systemic violence against communities and individuals? You know, as you guys know, you know, from witnessing evictions, they're violent acts. And if they're carried out by sheriff departments, they're carried out with someone that has a badge and a gun. And there's a, there's a moment of physical removal. And so that just the moment itself has, um, has, has parts of it or aspects of it that are, very, that are very violent. I just gave a talk on eviction yesterday, um, and an eminent sociologist of segregation, Doug Massey, was there. And he said, you know, if parents throw kids out on the street in the wintertime, that's called abuse. But uh, if you do it through an eviction, it's just called an addiction, you know? 
And uh, so there's, there's something to that, you know. Um, then you can ask, well, what does eviction do to someone's life? And I've spent the last several years trying to answer that question. And it does a lot. It does quite a lot. You know, an eviction record can harm your chances of moving into decent, affordable housing. So we know that families, after they're evicted, they move into worse neighborhoods and into worse housing. If we want to know why some low-income families live with lead paint and exposed wires and other things that are really terrible for kids' health, one reason is they're forced to accept those conditions in the harried aftermath of an eviction. Um, an eviction record often can bar you from public housing because housing authorities count evictions as a mark against your record, which means we're systematically denying housing help to uh, arguably families that most need it. We have good evidence that eviction causes you to lose your job. And some of you out there who've been through an eviction know why. It's such a consuming stressful event that it can cause you to make mistakes at work and eventually lose your footing in the labor market. And then there's the effect eviction has on your spirit, your mental health. We have evidence that moms that get evicted have higher rates of depression two years later. We know that suicides attributed to foreclosures and evictions doubled between 2005 and 2010. And so when you add all that up, you know, I think we have to conclude that eviction is a cause of poverty, not just a condition. It's making, it's making life harder, and it's casting people on a different and, and more difficult path. Thank you. Um, and Matt, I think that gives a really, like, I think, deep and um, comprehensive look at, like, the impact of evictions on families and individuals. Can you say a little bit more about how you think evictions affect kind of at the community and, and the broader societal level? So, you know, like as these evictions are happening, how is it affecting the neighborhoods? How is it affecting broader yeah. communities, um, people, groups, larger groups, et cetera? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's an important point. Um, and oftentimes, Folks who get evicted are moving from a neighborhood that they like to a neighborhood that they don't like. And so what's that mean? Well, that means some neighborhoods lose a stabilizing presence. They lose, you know, those porch sitters that can, like, call out trouble when they see it coming down the block. They lose uh, neighbors that have deep community ties with um, folks that are on the block and with their kids. But the neighborhood that gets that family after an eviction often doesn't gain a stabilizing presence because a lot of the families – they kind of accept um, a lesser option in the difficult hours after an eviction, and they don't invest in that block. And sometimes they just see themselves as passing through. And, um, and even if they're passing through for a number of years after their eviction, we, we also know that like, when we work together at a neighborhood level, we can really uh, make a difference. We can drive crime down. We can uh, push disorder of a certain kind out of our neighborhood. But we, we can't do that if we don't have a chance to be a community. And, you know, if you have neighborhoods that have high rates of evictions that are constantly turning people in and out of those communities, you know, they, they, it really strains the social fabric of a neighborhood. And, uh, and that can have an effect on things like a crime rate. So in Milwaukee, neighborhoods with more evictions have higher rates of violent crime the year later. And I think we know why. You know, because, um, you know, these churning environments make sure that neighbors remain strangers and don't kind of exercise their full civic capabilities. So you're absolutely right to point to the community level of facts and fiction, too. Hmm. Great. And um, thank you, Matt. Last question I wanted to have you share with us. Um, you know, often when people talk about big problems like gentrification, when they talk about the housing crisis, um, we often hear people talking about them as inevitable processes that kind of quote unquote just happen. Can you talk more about the role that government plays in creating and sustaining the eviction crisis that you've described? Yeah, I mean, that's another really deep question. Um, you know, one way they they contributed a major way to evictions is um, by not investing in a serious way in affordable housing initiatives. 
you know, we, we have a situation where only one in four families that qualifies for any kind of housing assistance receives it. And the waiting list for public housing in some of our biggest cities is not counted in years, it's counted in decades. So a single mom, for example, that applies for public housing in D.C. today, she might be a grandma by the time her application comes up. And so, you know, the that, that situation would be rather unthinkable when it comes to other kinds of basic necessities. Imagine if we turned away three and four families that apply for food stamps, saying, I'm sorry, we don't have enough to go around, you have to go hungry. But that's exactly how we treat um, families of moderate means searching for affordable shelter today. We don't have to accept that situation. You know, we have enough resources in this wealthy country to make a serious investment in in uh, in affordable housing. Um, we've just made decisions about how to spend those resources. And those decisions have, at least when it comes to housing, uh, have, have benefited uh, more affluent families a lot more than they've benefited uh, low-income families because in the, in the form of the, the amount of money we're spending on homeowner tax benefits every year. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today and for shining the light on a crisis that too few people are thinking and talking about, but that is affecting way too many around the country. So thank you for being here. I know I said earlier, as a housing organizer, we really thank you for the work that your um, book has done in terms of lifting up this issue and kind of bringing it into uh, the national discourse. So um, at this time, uh, Matt, if you want, you can go ahead and uh, mute your um, phone uh, okay. until we come to the discussion section, and then I'll have you unmute yourself. Um, I want to bring in to the conversation at this time Ms. Deborah Arnold. Deborah, do you mind waving uh -huh. to everybody? Thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, um, Ms. Deborah, welcome very much. Um, Thank you. Deborah is a mother of one daughter and four granddaughters. She lives in Mechanicsville, a historic African-American community in Atlanta, Georgia, where she grew up. She's a songwriter, author, or organizer, and an amazing singer. So if you are ever in the same room as Ms. Deborah, please talk her into um, sharing a song with you. Um, Deborah is also one of the founders of the Tenant Association at the Rosa Bernie Project-based Section 8 Apartments and a member of Atlanta's Housing Justice League. Welcome, Ms. Deborah. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Ms. Deborah, like, I'd like to ask you to start by sharing a little bit about yourself. Yes. My name is Deborah Arnold, and I am a mother of one daughter, one beautiful daughter, and four grandgirls. Uh, my granddaughters are my joy. Um, I have lived in the neighborhood of Mechanicville in Atlanta, Georgia, for 47 years. I grew up in Rosa Bernie, a Section 8 project of affordable housing, uh, which is privately owned. I finished high school on time with my class because I had a child. I attend college, undergrad, and graduate school from this neighborhood. I had worked uh, at since a teen uh, on two jobs and attended school, and like I said, raising a child. Um, later in life, uh, because of my health, I had to get on a fixed income, so I needed affordable housing. I stayed in this area of Mechanicsville because it was close to the city. It was convenient to the downtown business district. Um, it had a great view of the city. I needed babysitting and family support. Um, I had no car at the time, and the bus line was available, and my church was near. And plus, my roots in the Kennedy would go back to my great great grandparents. Um, later, uh, I saw the need in. Uh, to bring positive image to the neighborhood. So I invited the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, and they granted us some um, scholarships for our students to take dance classes. And also we invited Durwood Fincher, uh, a famous comedian known as Double Talk, and he brought lots of laughs and fun to our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, Ms. Deborah, what changes have you seen in your community? 
Uh, the change that I saw was gentrification. Um, when we talk of gentrification, um, first we learned about, about it from the news that our area will be the most exclusive place to live, uh, and we became concerned. We welcome new development. We welcome change, but we do not want to be displaced from our neighborhoods. Uh, this area is referred to as the Turner Field, a major venue in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, that was held for the Olympics in the 90s. And it's the home of a major uh, professional football team. So we learned that eight, um, about 80 acres of, the, of this downtown area will be sold. My neighborhood, Mechanicsville, and other surrounding neighborhoods will be affected by it. Um, I saw a few changes in my own apartment, uh, Rosa Barney. We started having problems in the building, such as uh, having to pay for our own appliances and we're renting, uh, paint, water bills, and many inspections. Uh, one recent inspection, over 90% of the residents did not have the proper notice and was written up for housekeeping and said that they had to get an order or else. Uh, we received inspection at least once a week for many months, and the tenants were very tired and stressed. And, Ms. Deborah, are you all seeing evictions increase in your community? Uh, yes, I, I did see see that. Um, I did see that, and it caused some, and, some health issues too. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, say that again. It caused what? I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, there were some health issues because of eviction. I endured stress with the many inspections mm. and high water bills. My daughter asked, uh, "Why are so many inspections?" And um, I should not. You know, stress myself out over the water bill. Because of the high water bills, there were not enough money to enjoy even the small things, such as taking my granddaughter uh, to the movies. Um, we lost over half of our residents and many neighbors. They felt like that there was no hope. One tenant had to pull money from her 401k for an emergency mm. to pay for her water bill to even survive. However, she still moved. I knew something had to be done. Um, two other tents and myself on May 19th, 2015, we organized a tent association of City Zoo at Rosa Barney Townhouse Apartments. When we started this association, the management was mad. They did not want us to meet in the conference room, so we met outside in the gazebo. Mm -hmm. They tried to evict me with threats of infraction. Uh, one was, um, see, our water system runs off of one main pipeline in, in my building, and I had a clause in the pipe and was written in infraction which says, if it happens again, your lease will be terminated. Departments mm -hmm. were not being maintained because the owners were always refused to keep departments uh, to par. There was some some of these were some of my stresses. Um, I met a leader uh, named Sharice Brown, who is a Housing Justice League organizer and a Vista worker who formed uh, who informed me that the apartment resident contract was ending. Uh, and we did not know about it at all. I then reached out and joined the Housing Justice League, with, uh, which is a uh, resident group that helps stop wrongful evictions and displacements. I learned my rights as a tenant and gained tenant power to fight back. I also joined NAT, which is a national alliance of HUD tenants. This organization is a national alliance which gives tenant power. So this June 2016 will be my first uh, attendance of the conference. Um, I will be enriched and knowledgeable on how to effectively lead as a tenant leader 
and I'm so excited about it. Thank you so much, Ms. Deborah. Uh, Ms. Deborah, before I um, before I uh, let you go, I I wanted to see if you could answer like one more or give us one more perspective. What um, what kind of hope or inspiration would you give the folks in other communities um, who are facing the threat of eviction or displacement? What will you say to folks who are who are facing that struggle? Um, Um, first, I would say you must join together with other residents with positive hopes that you will win. And everything you do, do it together. You can have power in numbers. There are others who are experiencing the same problem. Organizing is the key. I joined with other tenants and formed a tenant association. We started to meet and take action, and we started to win. Amen. Thank you for that, Ms. Deborah. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome Melanie um, into the conversation. Melanie, go ahead and um, give us a wave. Yay! Um, so everyone, Melanie is an immigrant from Jamaica who has a long history of community engagement and advocacy in the Boston area. Her work as a community organizer began in 2008 at City Life Vida Urbana after she volunteered um, as a result of having to fight off a post foreclosure eviction um, that allowed her and her children to stay in their home. Her eviction fight invo involved a blockade that was national news, including in Jet Magazine. She played a crucial role in building a base of community leaders that organized around housing displacement and gentrification in the greater Boston and Brockton area. As a lead organizer, she anchored national bank negotiations, shared the anti-displacement organizing model, and coordinated mass mobilizations and housing occupations. Melanie has been on the steering committee of the Right to the City Alliance, led efforts to build a black organizing network in Boston, and she is currently organizing director at Massachusetts Jobs with Justice Welcome, Melanie, and thank you so much for being here. Um, no Melanie, I wanted to start by I wanted to start by asking how did you get involved in organizing against evictions? Um, so, like you said, I I had um, bought a home back in um, early 2000 at the prime of the market and lost my home in 2006, but quickly realized that I shouldn't have to leave my home, leave my neighborhood. Um, I didn't no longer own the loan, but I could definitely pay to stay. Um, and so I, I came and got help from allies and members of my community to fight to stay in my home. And it kind of um, sparked something. The next day, the phones were ringing off at the hook. We knew that this wasn't just a Melanie problem, but we didn't realize the magnitude of the problem until I stood up, which um, kind of shows the importance of people being willing to stand up and take a stance. If I hadn't done that, so many people wouldn't have found the strength to do that. So that's how I came into this work. Great. Melanie, can you say a little bit more about like um, about the organizing model that you all use at City Life Vida Urbana and how is it that you all organize um, both against evictions, displacement, um, both for homeowners and tenants? Just tell us a little bit more about how that organizing looked like and what's the way that you all did that work. Um, so City Life is a leader-led movement, and I think first coming in when I came to City Life for help, there was a lot of agency that I'd had to think about what we could, I could do in my own destiny. And I think in some ways, the model was that they offered was we could block that eviction. But I think what it looks like is really up to both the, the type of home that you're defending and the person that you're really um, going out to, to support and defend. Um, we did a number of blockades, which basically meant when the bank said, we're coming to move you and your family out, we said, we know that there's a constable, we know that sheriffs might be here, police and movers, but we're not afraid. We're gonna stand up, we're gonna lock arms, and you're gonna have to take a bunch of us if you think you're gonna move this family out, and it worked. And 
I know that we, when we organize with folks, um, and I don't know if this is true of your experience, it's a big deal to ask people to assert that right. It's a big deal. People are scared. Um, people, as Ms. Deborah was saying, people uh, don't always know their rights. Um, in some places, people don't have a lot of rights. And there's a lot of fear in standing up to your landlord or a bank or the police, right? These are, or the housing authority, these are um, institutions and authorities that have been very um, harmful and threatening to many people in our community. Can you say a little bit more about how it, it, it how did you all actually work with folks to um, build up the, the desire, to build up the strength, the, the, to kind of really take on and work, uh, overcome those fears? Um, yeah, absolutely. The fears are real. Um, I think for us, what it more boils down to is what is the alternative? The alternative is something that's a lot more scary. Um, being out on the street, being in unsafe conditions. And I think that we deal with so many structures as people of color. This is an issue that impacts people of color disproportionately. And there are already a lot of systems that are against us that are scary, that cause fear in us. And so for, for us, it was more, why not take a stance? And if we lose, the worst thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna be put out. But if we don't fight, we're absolutely gonna put out, be put out. And this idea of protagonism, um, we've been talking about it a lot here at City Life, this idea that you know, going through this fearful situation gives you like a new sense of agency and strength that you almost didn't know that you had. And I feel like it's something that I've seen evidence of time and time again when people fight. I mean, even when people fight and ultimately have to move, we've gotten some, the strongest leaders out of those situations. And so I think there's something to be said about a lot allowing folks to overcome fear in, in real terms. And I think if more people realized that there were alternatives like this, there would be more people to stand up. That's why the phones are ringing off of the hook. I think we um, deal with systems and we work in the tight constraints of those systems. And they're there to kind of keep us behind. I love a lot of what I heard before about it being tied to like mass incarceration and things of that nature, because it's the reality for us. And so at that time, um, for me, there was much more fear with me being alone and the thought that I was gonna end up on the street than it was to stand up and tell the bank, no way I'm not gonna move. That's you right, thank that you also. so much for that. Yep, yep, I see that now. Um, so I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you exactly what you started talking about. Um, can you say from your experience of doing the work, like how, how do you see um, uh, that black people generally and black women specifically are being impacted by evictions in Boston and nationally? So building on some of what you just said, what's, what's your perspective on that whole issue? Um, I think it's real. I think that even back in 2007, 2008, we saw that most of the people that were in our rooms were women and women were um, playing the role of head of household much more than men um, across the board. And that was for a number of reasons. The first thing is mass incarceration. There are a lot of families that the male in the household is no longer there. You know, he's locked up while the woman is faced with being locked out. Um, I also think that when we think about, um, when we think about um, just even the idea of holding down a household, um, we have to think about the, the concept of jobs, right? And people as workers and not just folks that are residents. And the fact is that many of the women in households are the breadwinners right now. And so they would be at the forefront of the crisis. And I also think, you know, another thing that um, we're, we're having an opportunity to talk about more, um, when we were doing this work back in 2000, 7, 2008, it was mostly centered on post foreclosure eviction. But I think the reality of eviction across the board is something real. And some of these new housing laws that um, forces families to choose between their loved ones that may have committed a crime or being evicted from their residence has forced us, at least in my community, to see um, large scale evictions of women and their children out of their house in, in ways that I think some people are 
um, getting comfortable with it. It's becoming a norm. I, I, I think the crisis is so bad. You hear about it all the time. When we go in housing court, there's ma masses of women. And we, we're not saying that this isn't something that impacts men at all. But it's, it's the, the impact is much larger on women. But I think some of the social conditions around people of color and black folks and our, our relationship to the land and being stripped away from that and how our, our, the breakdown of our families has really caused this to impact women more. Yeah, um, you're, you're headed right where I was gonna ask you to take us, right? So you are a longtime organizer, both around housing justice and black liberation. Um, start, you know, you were starting to say this, but can you tell us a little bit more about how you see these issues as being connected? Like why for you, um, as a black woman, as a black woman organizer, as a housing justice organizer, like why these things are, are, are kind of connected, intertwined, like why these are critical um, struggles that you have committed yourself to? Um, because I think they are, they are very connected. I think that the laws around the land were created um, and really connected to things like the, the um, mass incarceration, and also our relationship to jobs and wealth when it comes to being the working class. I think that um, in some ways it's part of the plan. Um, and so we do see it affecting more black people than any other race. Um, and I, I definitely think that these issues are very much connected. I talked about some of the ways, right? That, you know, we, we the, the breakdown of families, the, um, the new laws around, you know, people that are involved with the legal system and making sure that they can't access things like public housing, even some of our um, services that we need to, to eat and to thrive. People have been shut out on because of having connections with um, the, the prison industrial complex. And I think that is one concrete way that we've been attacked. And, and the attack is not just one prong. It's like it starts with the prison industrial complex, but it trickles into housing and it trickles into jobs as well, um, which is which is another thing that we're completely being shut out and gentrified out of too. Okay. Thank you. Um, so when we started the conversation, I said, you know, and I know um, as a longtime leader uh, in Homes for All and in Right to the City, I know that you strongly believe that we are in a historic housing crisis right now um, in this country. Um, and we've talked about, I think a lot, you and I and all of our other folks um, in, in Homes for All have talked about how um, this presents both a moment of tremendous um, uh, uh, threats, but a lot of opportunities as well. Um, Melanie, we might have lost you, but let me just say the question and, and we can see if you're back. But can you tell us um, what you think is needed to build a strong national movement that can transform the relationship between working class and communities of color with land and housing? So, Melanie, you're back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat my question again. So I wanted you to just share what you think is needed in terms of building a strong national movement to transform the relationship that working class and communities of color have um, with land and housing in this country today? Um, absolutely. I think that um, the first thing, I mean, I, I know that we've been pushing for just cause eviction, and I think that, that that is first and foremost. I think it's something that we need to really um, take to our municipalities and we have to push for, because I feel like it's, the, it's part of the answer for us. I also think that as we build this movement, around um, be, uh, around displacement, that we have to consider other forms of displacement too and start to build into our analysis um, what's happening with people around jobs or even immigration, because I think it plays a big part when we, when we think about who it is that we see in the working class, who makes up the working class, and who are also the folks that are getting displaced. I think it's part of a conversation that we really have to think about and have. And then um, I just think the last thing, and I think this was just awesome to be able to hone in on the connection between um, not just mass incarceration, but 
um, policing of our communities. Um, I think in some ways, this whole idea, I mean, in my community, when you see the, the cops pull up, you know that either somebody's being being arrested for something they did, they're about to be moved out, or immigration's coming to take them out, right? And so uh, instead of it just being something that in our communities we embody and get used to, I think we need to get more people involved in the campaign um, through whatever lens fits for them. I'm really excited about it being homes for all, right? We're not just talking about commodified housing, we're talking about subsidized housing. There's an attack on folks in Section 8 housing, um, and I think all of that um, needs to be, we need to start to figure out how we talk about um, it as a working class issue. I know for years as we've organized around stopping people from being displaced and helping people to get back in homes afterwards, one critical component was jobs. Many people had no jobs and if they did, they didn't have good jobs. And so as much as we're fighting for them to be sustained without the ability to pay, it, it's not real. And then when I got into the arena fighting for jobs for folks, like we fight for residency policy and we fight for jobs for women and people of color in certain areas, but at the same time, we're getting gentrified out. So we're almost setting policies for like this new wave of folks that are not us, that are not the working class, that don't have the same issues as we do. And I think it excites me to be able to think of that too. And I also think one of the things that we could do to build a strong movement is to think about how we um, start to build some, or start to have a relationship. I don't even know if I wanna call it an alliance right now, but build relationships with people that are playing responsible roles. I know that, you know, historically we've kind of been like, oh, landlord developer, but I feel like we're at a time where we need to start to have some examples of what responsible ownership can look like what a responsible landlord could look like, what a responsible developer can look like, so that we're able to change um, to change the culture, change the way that people think about relationship, but about tenant and landlord relationship, or even relationship to us, to the land, particularly us as black folks. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so uh, that concludes the kind of uh, presentation portion of our conversation. Um, we're going to move uh, to a kind of more question and answer discussion um, section. So um, Matt and Miss Deborah and Melanie, if you want to just unmute yourself, I'm going to um, I'm going to start sharing some of the questions that the participants are posing to different ones of you. Um, I will let you know if we're getting any feedback or anything, then you might need to mute yourself, but certainly remember to unmute yourself when you start talking. So um, I want to thank everybody who's been sending in your comments, um, uh, you know, sharing your questions, et cetera. We, we, we hopefully are going to be able to get to most of them. Um, and uh, so I want to, I want to start with um, this question from Beverly in Oklahoma city and Matt, I wanted to see if you could tackle this question. Uh, Matt, are you? Do we have you? Yeah, I hope so. Perfect. Okay, we hear you. Great. So, Matt, can you? So, this is um, Beverly. Forgive me. I'm slightly paraphrasing your question here. But Matt, the question is: You would think that evictions are not good business for landlords. They lose tenants, which results in a loss of income for them. So if that is the case, why do engage, why do landlords engage in evictions? What is the, you know, can you say more, Matt, about what is the motivation? What is the basis? Like, why, why evictions for landlords? Why is this part of the business model? Uh, every city is a bit different. You know, what Melanie is seeing in Boston is kind of a different thing that's going on in cities like Detroit or Milwaukee or Baltimore. In cities like that, so in, in high cost cities, you know, eviction is often propelled by gentrification forces and landlords are trying to turn buildings over so they can command higher rents. But sometimes that's not the case and they're evicting folks from pretty uh, low income areas and, uh, and it's not a gentrification story. So what's up with that? And what I saw is that it's cheaper for a landlord to evict you to, to maintain their properties and they can withdraw from maintaining their properties by renting to tenants who are extremely rent burdened. 
And so if I'm a tenant that pays 60 or 70 percent of my income to rent, I'm going to have to ask my landlord a favor one of these days. And a lot of times out of those situations, tenants move in behind on day one because they can't pay first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit. So what does that mean? That means a landlord, uh, a tenant gets a home, but a landlord gets to kind of skimp on maintenance because he or she knows that if the tenant calls a building inspector, they could be evicted. It's illegal to retaliate against tenants for calling the city and reporting housing problems, but you can, in most municipalities, evict someone at any time for being behind. So there's a trade-off at the bottom of the market. Evictions, in a way, are an efficient inefficiency that some landlords have accepted because um, that hit to their profit margins is smaller than the hit that they take uh, when it comes to maintaining properties to code. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Deborah, I wanted to direct the next question to you. Um, this question is from Ms. Khadija. What's up, Khadija? Um, so, Ms. Deborah, um, and Ms. Deborah, you know Khadija, right? She was with us in Chicago. Um, she sent her love, and she's got a question. So she says, um, what are some of the ways that those of us who are organizing with people, what are some of the ways that we are responding to the internal struggle within our communities, right? So some of what she's asking about, what, what do you do um, when people are in denial, for example, that there's a problem, right? Or, or, or that they're facing threats to their housing and their kind of community stabilization. Um, how do you deal when people don't have hope or a belief in collective power, right? Um, how, so what would you say, Ms. Deborah, to, to that question? How are you dealing with challenges in the work and in the organizing that you're doing? Well, I, I listened to other testimonies, and I saw that there was hope within those testimonies, and that encouraged me, like, okay, if it happened with them, it could happen with us. So that will really, you know, motivate me, like, hey, I can move forward. So you can move forward because you're not the only one that's in this battle. It's all over the world. So um, just be encouraged. Thank you. Melanie, you want to weigh in on this? I feel like you've got a lot to say on this question. What do you, what do you say to this? How do, how, do you, how do you build hope? How do you build protagonism? How do you, believe, uh, how do you build belief in collective power? For for us, um, it's really just, or for me, it's really just meeting people where they're at um, and understanding that not everybody's going to be at the same place. I think it's it's a key component of organizing, no matter what the issue is, is that you have people that are ready to stand up and you have some folks that are just ready to get information. And I think for us, being able to deliver critical information to help people just figure out why they're in this position in the first place is big. And I think those small things we need to start to really celebrate and, and give credit to. I often see people that walk in the doors at City like the first meeting and they look at us because we say what we do here is not normal. And they're like, you guys are freaking crazy. And they leave, but they come back at some point. Some people, it's a little, but I. Hey, Melanie, so, we, we're losing you. You're breaking up. You probably want to start over. Um, if you could start where you started to say at City Life, people would come in and tell us that we're crazy. Did we lose you, Melanie? Okay. Um, it sounds like we lost Melanie for a second. I'm going to keep going. Um, Matt, there's another question for you. Um, Melanie, when you come back on, I'm going to let you uh, come back to finishing answering the question. I'm just going to go to Matt for a second. Um, so, Matt, there's a question um, uh, folks are really interested in learning more about some of the methodology um, in terms of the data and how you do this. So, um, one, let me just get the specific question. Um, so this, the question from Kyle in Los Angeles is, 
what cities have you and your colleagues collected eviction court record data in? Um, have you encountered any challenges that you think would be useful to folks who are trying to do the same kind of work? And how did you overcome those challenges? Melanie, I'm going to let Matt answer this question. I'm going to come back to you in a second um, to, to get the rest of your answer. Um, Matt, did you get the question? Yeah, so um, we have data from Milwaukee, Chicago, Boston, Cleveland, Kansas City, and a few other cities uh, that we're working on right now. A lot of the times you don't need, like, a computer programmer to be on your team to get these data. They exist in a data set that the city has, usually the county has. It's kind of just about getting someone to – getting to someone that can speak your language, you know what I mean? And so if you go to the records department, that's usually not who is able to speak your language. It's usually the IT guys. Any county that has a system, a web system, where you can search eviction records uh, has a huge database of evictions. And you can use that database to ask questions like, which neighborhoods in my city have the highest eviction rates? Are evictions going up and down over time? Where do most of my evictions happen in, in the city? Um, it's just it's just a matter of getting counties to re to release the, those data. I'm working really hard on that right now, and we're trying to get these data out publicly. Uh, but it's kind of like a ground game. It's kind of like county by county. There's no there's no centralized eviction uh, reporting in in the country. Um, thank you, Matt. And there was also a question about whether or not you would be willing to share the survey or some of the kind of uh, questions that you use um, in gathering the data. Yeah, for sure. So the survey and the data actually are all publicly available. They're on um, something called the Harvard Dataverse. So if you just Google Harvard Dataverse, and then you could there's like a search search bar there. And you could just search evictions or Milwaukee area renter study and or or my name, Matt Desmond, and you'll be able to find the survey instrument and, and the data as well. Great. Thank you. So Melanie, back to you. You were in the middle of telling us how you organize and how you help people um, push through and move beyond some of the internal struggles. So please. Um, you know where you left off was um, the last thing I think we heard you say was when people would walk into city life and you would tell them what you did and how you did it and people would be like, you're crazy, and then they would leave and then they would come back. That's kind of where we where we lost you. Yeah, um, I, and I think that that's really important for us to recognize is that not everybody is going to be willing to stand up, but I think that them being able to see us stand up is important. And then also just finding ways to engage people. I think one of the things that you touched on was like the court records and the court process. And we've been able to engage people in, in other things like come join us as we do these auction protests or as we go to court and get cases, like let people know that they should be transferring to housing court. Or there are, there are smaller steps you can take to involve people before that big push to, to say, hey, you know, take this on, do this blockade, things like that. Right. Um, Melanie, I was actually wondering if you could say a little bit more about how a b blockade works. Like, what's a blockade and how do you do it and what can it result in? Um, so a blockade is really when a family has been given final notice when every, um, every avenue we have in court is we've exhausted. And the constable was ordered to come out to the house. The movers are scheduled to come out. We put out an alert to our base of people. We've built a lot of people that are willing to come out and show support. And folks show up um, an hour before the movers are scheduled to come um, at the house. And there are people that are willing to risk arrest, um, usually not the person that's being evicted, but allies that are willing to put themselves on the line and be arrested for someone. And we also have um, very strong relationships with the attorneys that we usually usually have at least one on site that kind of both works as a liaison between us and the bank. Um, and then if there are arrests, works as like the liaison between the folks that are there on site and the folks that have been taken off arrested. Usually 
um, we win. I mean, the bank doesn't want that bad publicity. They don't want to look that horrible. There's a picture of like the family, the children. And in most cases, the banks leave these homes boarded up and it's blightness in the community. So we also build with the neighbors around um, before the blockade, let them know what's happening, get them on board to why it's important for this person to fight. And in most neighborhoods, people, it's a neighbor. We're not defending people that have been there for two years in most cases. We're defending folks that have been there for a number of years that have built relationships in the community. And we also reach out to the small businesses in the area too, because I feel like at some point in our struggle, there's the need to kind of think about when we first started doing this, we got attacked by like small business owners. And, and so it made sense to also build unity as well too. We never do a blockade without um, welcome, having the community welcome us there. So it seems like we're doing this weird thing in their neighborhood that's not justified. I will say blockades have been much more doable for us in the urban areas than they have been in the suburban areas where there are a lot less people of color um, because it really takes buy-in from folks. But what they do is like, we look at where the property is, my blockade, we even had a Mack truck at the end of my street. It was a dude I didn't even know. And he was like, those MFs are not getting down there if I could help it. And it's a really, it's a really humongous act of solidarity. Most people that we do blockades for, their families are not there because they've been so ashamed to even let people know. It's the first time that they're really publicizing what they've been going through. Um, and it really takes being open enough to allow somebody to support you. There's like a huge um, plan. There's a lot of planning that goes into a pre and post to make sure folks are, are supported. One of the things that we always say is these folks are not, are not, um, we're not doing anything for them when we do a blockade. The subjects of our blockades are doing a huge justice for the movement. And so we have to recognize that. Um, so even there are times that, you know, we've seen people get moved out. Um, there's times we've moved them back in and whatever else, but we celebrate all kinds of victories. One, it's kind of like in labor, one day longer, one day stronger. It's for families too, that same thing. And most times by the time we get to blocking an eviction, it's given people an opportunity, even if they do have to get moved out, to, to come up with a plan B um, and to get support around it so it doesn't feel so hard. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Ms. Deborah, I wanted to bring you into the conversation a little bit. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, so we're getting some questions about just the nature of the housing crisis. Um, and just for folks who are listening um, to the conversation, the perspective of Homes for All is that the national housing crisis is a broad one, um, of which there are many component parts. Um, evictions, which we are talking about specifically today, is caused by and is a result of many things that people have talked about. Um, foreclosures, you know, we, Melanie talked about the way we saw a lot of evictions during um, foreclosure period, and those were both evictions of homeowners and tenants. Um, Ms. Deborah has started to talk about the ways in which eviction um, is playing out for public housing residents, um, you know, um, some of what Matt talked about and a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, of, of the stories in Matt's book um, that talks about the impact of evictions on people uh, who have Section 8 vouchers. So for those of you who are asking about whether or not um, we understand and see all these different component parts as being a part of the same big problem, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, evictions are one component. They are caused by many things. Um, and everything from the lack of affordability that people have talked about to the lack of um, uh, uh, response on the part of both private landlords and housing authorities to upkeep and maintain buildings, um, the ways in which banks and financial institutions and speculators have refused to um, respect tenant protections and tenant rights, do re uh, repairs, um, and, and respond to, to tenant requests. All these are things that um, constitute uh, the broad housing crisis as we understand it today. So, um, Ms. Deborah, I just wanted you to say a little bit more um, for folks who are in public housing, um, and if you want to speak to folks who are uh, 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 using and have uh, vouchers, um, what do you think 
uh, are some of the big threats um, that that folks are dealing with today. So I know earlier when you spoke, you mentioned maintenance and other things like that, but I wanted to see if you wanted to add anything else in terms of for folks in housing, what are you all looking at? Right, and what can we do about it? Sure, actually, yes, if you wanna if you wanna address that, that would be great too. Um, some of the threats. Um well well we had threats, you know, when you have threats, it's it's really time to take control and um when you come together, I mean, sign petition. Um, um, sign petition to come together. Let them know that you're serious, you know, about your stand, and um, you want affordable housing, and we really like demand that they hear what you have to say. That um, that you know you're not going to take down. Um, so petition. Is number one, and always I have always said this: coming together is the key. And Ms. Deborah, can you say a little bit more about why, for your uh, tenant association and for the Housing Justice League, why is it that you all have connected to a to national groups like the HUD Association of Tenants, Y to Homes for All? Um, for you, for you all, why is it important uh, to your to your local struggles and your local everyday fights um, to take the time and to take the energy to connect to these larger national groups and these larger national issues? You need allies because there are bullies. They will bully you, and it is something that you can't do on your own. It feels like you know uh, there's not enough tenant power. Um, Stand, they will uh, they will try to overtake you, bully you, threaten you as much as possible to get what they want. But when we join the uh, allies and housing justice and NAT, you know, they see that we have a giant that they won't be able to to beat. Thank you, Miss uh, Deborah. Um, I, I, I want to say the retreat at Chicago was wonderful. Um, it gave a lot of tenant power. I came back on fire and ready to fight even more. So I find it very important to engage in, in the retreat, uh, just hearing the testimony, hearing what people go through, getting knowledge and being rich. It helped a whole lot. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Melanie, I wanted to um, pose a question that we are getting from Miguela in Oakland to you. Um, so the question is, um, what are some of the ways that folks are thinking or that you organize across um, different racial and income groupings and strata? So, for example, how do you bring together low-income uh, renters with, like, uh, more middle-income folks or homeowners? What are the ways that you all have organized around some of the race and class lines um, to, to kind of advance the housing justice struggle? Um, so, uh, and then if you, if you can and want to speak to as well, can you say if you have any examples of how to organize kind of new residents moving into the neighborhood with old residents? But I think you kind of get my idea, right? This is, this is about how we build across some of the lines, new residents, old residents, um, lower income, higher income. What are some of your, your experiences around that? Um, so I could say one, are you guys hearing me? Are you hearing me? Okay. Um, so I could say for me, one of the things that comes up immediately is um, the times when we've been able to do work around development that's coming to our area, it, it's been an opportunity to tie in the impact to um, residents that own homes, the impact to folks that are renters, to impact to folks that are in low income housing complex and what that really means for us. Um, I think that has been one way that we've been able to kind of come together and talk about it other than this Homes for All campaign. Um, I think it's been important too because we also see that 
people go through waves. Um, it's so connected to um, gentrification and jobs as well, too. I know for me, when I had to move out of my home, I moved into an apartment not far away from there. Um, and within a year, I was faced with eviction again, not because I was a bad tenant, not because I couldn't pay, um, but because it's it's just kind of an epidemic, you know, um, as development comes in, everybody's looking to see how they could get rid of what they got so they could get a piece of this new pie. Um, and I've even seen where it's impacted our, our HUD housing, you know, which is supposed to be, you know, um, housing that's designated for low income people. We've seen extreme cuts to the units of affordability um, because there's so much greed and because there's so few regulations. And a lot of times there's so much that we don't know. Um, I also wanted to kind of echo the importance of being involved in larger national campaigns. That's when we learned about things like that, the um, low income housing trust fund or things that are there to protect us but are not being used in that way because nobody's holding folks accountable. Um, I think nowadays we're seeing more and more ways before there was definitely this divide where people with section eight were fighting on one end, people, you know, but we're all under attack so much through the form of development. Um, they call it urban renewal, urban removal, whatever you want to call it. It's really creating an opportunity for folks to come together and fight together. And it's also, also there are people now that are at the table that are not even at risk of losing their homes, but are, are worrying about their jobs or, you know, worrying about businesses in some areas. Here in Boston, we have seen patterns of displacement really dovetail with development that's coming to our city in a big way. Great, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Matt, I think I'm gonna give you uh, the last question. I'm, I'm trying to see whether we have time for more than that, but um, so there's a question from Revel in Madison. Um, Matt, do you know uh, if there is a city or municipality that has attempted to standardize the eviction process outside of small claims court? Uh, Revel is thinking that this is one option that the courts might support reducing the caseload, um, but that this might also be a means by which to intervene in how evictions are being carried out, documented, et cetera. Is this anything that you can speak to? I haven't heard of that yet. Um, I do know there's a movement within legal studies to think about how to make civil courts mo more what, the, what is called pro se friendly or more friendly to families that don't have representation uh, in civil court. There are also a, a handful of courts, there's one in Cleveland, there's one in New York City that have um, kind of expanded their vision of the court beyond um, did you pay the rent or not question, but kind of asking are asking questions like what led you to fall behind the rent and that kind of thing. So I don't know of any county or municipality that has offloaded um, evictions outside of small claims or civil court. I do think that we have to really fix the root cause of the issue, this lack of affordable housing in our cities. That, that without fixing that, uh, other adjustments like expanding protections are, are, are not going to fall. Then we're not going to get as much done if we don't fix the, the underlying root, 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 root causes. I think that's my two cents. It's um, it's really been an honor to be here. Thank you guys so much for your work and all you're doing out there. Great. All right, but we're not done yet. Um, I wanted okay. to. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and let me just. Um, uh, just address this one to Melanie. So Melanie, this question is from Chris in Texas, Austin, Texas. And really what he's saying is that he doesn't think that they realistically will be able to, to secure stronger tenant protect, protections through legislation. Um, so he is asking about um, tactics for doing direct bargaining with developers and landlords, um, and I know this is something you like have a lot of experience with. Can you share with folks like 
how uh, both through direct bargaining, direct action, you know, I, I know uh, building up of tenant unions, uh, bank tenant unions, the, the kinds of things that you all have done, how, how to um, address evictions um, outside of just exerting just cause or tenant protection, actual legal rights. So um, here at City Life, we've always referred to that type of an intervention as the sword and the shield. Um, the sword is our, our pressure, our public protests, our collective bargaining, and the shield is the court process, legislation, things that kind of protect us as we, we you know, do the, the things in the street. I would urge you, I know that we all initially have, um, we doubt whether or not we're able to kind of move legislation or pass it, but I will say years and years of continuing to try will get a victory. But I think it also should be complemented. It's not really either or, but I think collective bargaining is such a huge piece of it. No. Dawn, you're muted. Thanks, Tony. Um, so, folks, it looks like we we lost um, Melanie. I'm going to give her a few seconds to connect back. But um, in the meantime, I just want to um, make a pitch um, and encourage all those of you who are thinking about how to do these sites in your city, in your towns, um, to consider us at Homes for All, your partners, your allies, um, your your uh, potential co-conspirators. Um, we have uh, folks, over 50 groups all over the country, um, a chunk of whom are working on exactly some of the issues that we're talking about today, tenant protection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, joining and reaching out to us at Homes for All uh, is going to be a very um, good way for you to be able to get a lot of the questions answered that we weren't able to get to today. Melanie, I'm going to give you a chance to just finish up. I think you were starting to talk a about a question that's actually really important. So please go ahead and, um, and, and finish up what you were saying before we close. So I was just saying that um, the important, the collective bargaining is a really important piece of this and the ability to do collective bargaining. I think most tenant associations in buildings with larger landlords are really, I think that the, what builds power for the residents is really being able to come to the table and say, this is what we need to really say, this is what we want and have a way to bargain for that. It's, it's critical and it's an important component. I would even say, even if I was in a city that had complete openings for legislation, that is like the strongest piece of anything that we have. And it's what's really going to get you the victory in other places because so much of what we need to do is unique. It's different. It's like transformative. It's not, we know that the laws around housing and everything else are wrong. And so, so much of we, what we need to be doing is creating a new wave of thinkers around what this can actually look like. And um, yeah, so I definitely would say, but I also would say the beauty of the Hopes for All campaign, I say this everywhere I go, it's not because I'm just on this webinar, but is that it's a place where you can really share best practices, get information, and continue to have dialogue and exchanges. So I would say for my friend in Texas, let's continue to talk and think about what it is that you guys are faced with on the ground and see if there are things that we can help you with. This is what we used to do when we would go around and share the model. Conditions. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much. So folks, as we move to wrap up, I wanna thank our presenters for their incredible insight. I know that all over the country, uh, almost 400 people are clapping loudly for Melanie, uh, Ms. Deborah, and, um, and Matt. Thank you all for joining this conversation today, which has given me so much hope about the possibility of transformation, uh, taking crisis and turning it into opportunity. Um, this is a critical historic moment and it calls for all of us to learn more about the housing crisis, 
Uh, but more importantly, we believe that it calls on all of us to act. Um, so, you know, uh, as you can see, we're organizers, and um, our goal is to, is to grow the movement. And we are together from Atlanta to Boston to Oakland to Texas. Um, we are building a national housing justice movement that is based on racial, economic, and gender justice um, because that's what it takes, right? Um, and uh, we are asking all of you today um, to commit to supporting this organizing that is happening by and in impacted communities. Uh, help us build and grow a real movement that can ensure that all people and all communities can live affordably, sustainably, because housing is a human right and we need homes for all today. And before you go, I want to make a last pitch. Um, so please consider buying Matthew's book today. Um, it's not only good for Matthew, it's not only good for your brain, um, but it's also going to be really good for Homes for All because thanks to Acapella Books in Boston, I'm sorry, in Atlanta, Acapella Books in Atlanta, um, Homes for All will receive 10% of all, all sale proceeds to support our work. And I can just I can assure each and every one of you on this call, we really, really need that resource support. So um, thank you for joining us today. Um, please um, learn more about Homes for All. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Matthew. Um, we conclude our webinar here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.